So, um, this is the story of a designer, that's me, designing an archive for designers. Um, and I'm having a lot of fun doing this. So here is what the archive looks like and uh, a simple statement of what we're about. Um, this is a new development. Um, I've been collecting for 40 years, but the archive just opened this year. And here is uh, a bit of a timeline uh, that explains sort of how this came to be. In a way, this really began with uh, a, a woman named Tanya Raposo, who was uh, a graduate of, of uh, the Type and Media program in The Hague, and found herself in San Francisco uh, without a working visa. Um, she's married to Frank Griesheimer, who uh, works at Adobe, and Adobe got him a visa, but she, she didn't have a working visa. So she ended up interning for me for a year. And this was while well, it was still basically a private collection in my home. And at the time, I was a management consultant. But what Tanya did for me is not only help organize the material and share her passion for it, but she also brought all her friends over. And that was very significant, because I'd been wondering what to do with this collection. Book collectors are kind of a strange breed. I, I don't actually think of myself primarily as a book collector. I think of myself as a designer who happens to collect. And, um, you know, book collectors, for example, obsess about condition and provenance and things that I think have no meaning to, to designers when they're looking at something. Um, I often prefer to buy a crappy copy of something because A, it's cheaper and I can get more stuff, and B, it's evidence of use and uh, character and interest. Um, so Tanya brought her friends and it opened to me the idea that there's a world that's interested in this stuff other than the old white men who collect books. You know, thinking about establishing an institution for them had no interest to me at all. And I spoke to a couple of institutions about donating the collection, but they were, they were all interested. Everybody wanted the collection but nobody would guarantee what they would do with it. And um, it just didn't seem to be very helpful. So um, in April 2013, sitting in the audience at Typo SF, I thought, okay, let's see if I can find a name. And I went on GoDaddy and looked around and found Letterform Archive, which I, I think is pretty good. Of course, these days, you gotta do the URL first, right? So, um, but it's turned out to be a pretty good name and it's, it has, clear and specific meaning. Um, in August of that year, I gave a talk at TypeCon about Dwiggins. And again, that was another exposure to um, this world of young professionals, students, educators, um, people that are passionate about this world and need this material. Um, so Sun Helen Isal Calvenis is another Type and Media graduate who took over from Tanya when she left. Um, and the rest of it you can see. Um, we did a Kickstarter for a calendar. Um, the grand opening was in February of this year. And um, we have an a new executive director, our first executive director as of June. Um, we opened a new space and acquired a major collection of type specimens in August. And we've just begun a partnership with the Cooper Union's uh, Type at Cooper, which is called Type at Cooper West, and uh, more about that later. So that's kind of the setup story. This is the cover slide of, of my Dwiggins talk uh, from a couple years ago. Dwiggins has been a passion of mine for, for many, many years. Um, and um, I'd say I've collected Dwiggins for maybe 35 years. I lived in Boston for a while, and so it was a good time and place to, to be collecting Dwiggins. Um, and now we're working on a major monograph about his work. Um, more about that later. Uh, this was our Kickstarter calendar. Um, I think there are some backers in the audience. Raise your hands if you were a backer of the calendar. Come on. I know that, Sumner, you were. Raise your hand. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, and also a few type designers that contributed typefaces, um, I, I, I think are in the audience. Um, so this was a calendar of 12 um, pieces from the archive and 220 birthdays of letter artists. Um, and it also featured 12 new typeface designs that um, was a curated selection that I did with uh, Stephen Coles. Um, this is the grand opening, although I realized this morning that the, um, the invitation is actually not for the grand opening. It's in the same form, but it's for a slightly different event. But this was the grand opening in February. Okay, so the backstory starts with who's doing this. Um, I don't normally like to talk about myself, but I kind of had to do it a little bit because it helps to explain what this is and how it's evolved into um, its current form. So this is me. This is, this is my, uh, my career. Um, actually, when I was doing this, at first I said my, you know, basically 40 years of a career, and then I realized that while I've sometimes said, especially in the last few years as I've come back to this world, that I took a wrong turn into business in the 80s. Um, in hindsight, I really see it as part of one design practice because I was trained as a designer and I think as a designer. And when, even when I was publishing and even when I was doing management consulting, that's essentially what I was getting paid for is um, it, well, in publishing, it's more direct. I was the creative director and publisher, so uh, that's a more obvious connection. But in management consulting, basically people were paying me to solve problems, and I was thinking about them as a designer thinks about problems, and that was something kind of special in, in the world of management consulting then. Now, design thinking is, and I apologize to Catherine for even using the word, but um, you know, it's a major buzzword and everybody's talking about it, but um, in hindsight, that's in some sense what I was doing, solving problems as a designer would. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about these things. My, my first passion was calligraphy and graphic design. I also um, went into some depth in photography and in, in school I studied both, basically. Um, they're gray at the end of the bars because now I consider myself more of an amateur um, and I don't practice as much as I'd like to, but it's still very much a part of me. Uh, I taught for six years at um, the Boston Museum School, which is an art school kind of like this, uh, and also at Tufts University in Boston. Um, book selling, um, I know there's at least one person in the room who bought books for me in those days, uh, and that began really as a reaction to having duplicates as the result of collecting. The, the way it started was I bought an estate of a designer and it had a lot of books that I already had, so hence I had duplicates. And instead of selling them at auction or in bulk, uh, I decided to, to have a little hobby book selling business, which I did for six years or so. So I, I published, as you'll see later, a few graphic arts titles, but I ended up uh, concentrating on children's picture books because, honestly, that's where the money was. Um, and um, so I did that for 12 years. Um, uh, the company was acquired by Simon & Schuster in 1993. And um, after that, I became a management consultant, which is a curious thing because it's something I had no training for. Um, in fact, in the last 10 years, I've often been in rooms with 60 or 70 percent MBAs, and I don't have a degree. So I kind of enjoyed that, actually. Um, and then as part of my consulting work, I did work for um, hospitality, and I also did, had some more direct involvement, uh, everything from party promotion to um, uh, investing in venues uh, and creative direction for hotels and restaurants. Uh, the archive you see, and you also see the collecting, which is a constant and apparently will continue. Um, so this is, this is me as a child. Um, I'm actually, okay. So the guy with the t-shirt, who's obviously the teacher, is Donald Jackson, in case anybody recognizes him. He's the, the British calligrapher. 
Uh, I'm up a little and to the left, um, and probably not quite recognizable, but this was a class, this was a, a two or three week residential class at Santa Cruz uh, in 1974, and it was my first sort of deep dive into calligraphy. Um, there were some other wonderful people in this class, David Meckelberg and Susie Taylor. Um, these names probably don't mean anything to you, but they do in the, in the calligraphy world. Um, and, and Donald was wonderful, and I, I eventually also spent six months in London working with Donald and with Anne Heckel, and also uh, reading at the British Museum and the Victorian Albert. Um, so here is some early, by the way, most of this is really quite embarrassing in hindsight. And I have to say that, um, well, first of all, remember this is like late 70s, early 80s. Secondly, I don't actually have an archive of my own stuff. So this is pretty random what I was able to dig up. But this is some of the kind of work that I did. This was uh, for the Boston Globe. Um, I could have killed the art director when I actually saw it printed, but I, I kind of liked the calligraphy. Um, this was for um, a calendar of Shakespeare quotes. Um, this is also for a calendar of quotes about music. Here's some pointed brush work. Um, the, the top one is a very long, flexible pointed brush that's held vertically, and the other one is a, is a thicker brush done sideways. Um, this is work that I did for four or five years, and it was really popular. I sold a lot of it. Uh, it's basically made with, with crayon and watercolor. Uh, this is another crayon resist piece. Uh, this is the only evidence I could find of my teaching. This is actually three typeface designs by students of mine from the early 80s. Now think about this. No computers, so not, not even fontographer, okay, let's be clear. These were created by pencil sketching, creating uh, the core sample letters, rendering in pen and ink um, sort of final forms of first the sample letters and then using a stat camera to create spacing tests and iteration, and then eventually rendering all 26 letters and pasting them up with a stat camera to make sentences. So um, some of us remember that world. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I had some quite good students, actually. Um, one of them was, was Gene Evans, who has done a few fonts. Um, and the others are mostly in graphic design or, or calligraphy. Um, OK, so these are some of the, the graphic arts books that I published. Uh, this is early 80s. There's a facsimile of a, of a manuscript by Marty Angel. Uh, the Neugebauer book, which was a collaboration with, with Michael Neugebauer and, and Neugebauer Press. Um, two books about post posters, Lance Heide's work and David Goines. And uh, The Development of Writing, which was a license from Nigli. Um, and we retitled it and he redesigned it. Um, that is Meyer's alternate cover design for the U.S. These are some of the children's books. Um, our, our two most famous and popular illustrators were Eric Carle, who's probably best known for The Very Hungry Caterpillar. We published about 12 of his books in the 80s. And also Lisbeth Sverger, who's um, just an exquisite illustrator. The Gift of the Magi is, is one of hers. We took great care with production and typography. And most of our title lettering was um, calligraphy or lettering or custom in some way. So on this slide, the top left, Gift of the Magi, and the top right, the Moon Lake, the lettering is by Michael Neugebauer, and the other five are by Julian Waters. Um, Julian worked with me for 
most of the time that we were doing children's books, um, I had a very simple brief. I, it was read the book and make up an alphabet. And uh, he did about 60 or 70 of them. So this one is his. This is uh, the title spread. Uh, I was doing most of the book design and also uh, book production, which was first in Europe and then mainly in Hong Kong. Uh, these are all Julian Waters titles for uh, books of ours. And as you can see, they're all different. Um, and they're all quite fresh, I think, even now. Julian is amazing. Um, and um, uh, we've been friends for a long time. He's actually working on a book for us now. Um, we had a photographic book series, um, which was the, the animal family book. So there was the chimpanzee family, the elephant family, the goose family. The, there were about 10 of them. Uh, this one was by Jane Goodall. And our books were uh, co-published around the world. Uh, this particular title was published in about 12 languages. Here we see German and Japanese. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is an alphabet book. Um, the calligraphy is Julian Waters throughout. Not sure how crisp that is. We also had a series of book audio packages. Um, of course, in the 80s, that meant cassettes. Um, this one, the, um, the story is the classic American tall tale, Pecos Bill. The um, actor who read it was Robin Williams, and it had a soundtrack with original music by Ry Cooter. On the right is um, one of the most fun things I've ever seen. It's a video of Pecos Bill that was released in Hong Kong for the Chinese diaspora at that time, which meant quite a large market, but not actually mainland China. And the narration was done by Chow Yun Fat. And I was in the studio when he was trying to do Robin Williams doing Western wild narration in Chinese. Um, that was kind of fun. Um, here, this shows the package better. This one is uh, narrated by Ben Kingsley with music by Ravi Shankar. Um, and the slipcase, actually I have, my one patent is, is for a little blister mold that hold, held the cassette. Um, and basically it was a, a, an open-sided slipcase with the book and the cassette. And it was unusual in the market at the time because most book cassette packages didn't have a permanent way to store them. So you'd get them home and you'd have these two pieces and nothing to hold them together. Um, this is, uh, <laughs> again, an old picture of me with a mustache in this case. Uh, this, is, this is the Bologna Children's Book Fair in 1992 when I was on the jury. I was on the jury several times for this. Um, okay, so now we're kind of segueing out of this. This is, um, this is actually an article about an exhibit taken from my collection in 1989. And uh, it shows some of the early passions that still continue. There's Dwiggins' work here. There's George Salter, there's Sister Corita, there's Paul Rand, and the non-Latin is Toko Shinoda from Japan. Um, this is a slide of hospitality. Again, it's what I could dig up. This was, this was a hotel in Oakland, which was um, basically renovated into a party hotel. And for a time, uh, we were the largest venue in the, in the Bay Area. Uh, our largest parties had over 5,000 people um, between the rooms, the courtyard, and the club space. Um, this is an example of, of a report from management consulting. And um, one of the things that I always paid a lot of attention to is design generally, but specifically information graphics. And um, it became it was a big part of my practice because there wasn't a lot of really good work being done at the time. And one of my favorite things to do was to walk into a conference room presenting um, a body of work and basically have the chief marketing officer or the, the people that we were, you know, the decision makers at the table say, 
I know what to do. Like, I can see from this what's going on, and I know what to do now. Um, so um, I, I enjoyed that. I worked with a lot of smart people. Um, it was kind of a wrong turn into business. I missed all, all the time that I wasn't immersed in design. I missed it, but I kept collecting, so it's OK. Um, this is kind of an oddball with a, a peripheral connection to, to letters. Um, this, is, this was a project I did at Burning Man some years ago. It's um, 21 totems made of mahogany, and the, the art is inspired by Mayan um, hieroglyphs. Uh, the art is not by me. The project was uh, conceived and creative directed by me. Okay, so that's me. Here is the rest of the team uh, for Letterform Archives. So we have four full-time staff members now. Uh, Simran Tadani, who's here. Uh, myself, we just hired a librarian, and uh, Kate Robinson is, is our collections associate. Um, she has an MBA in, in book art from Mills College. Um, the board of directors, um, four of us are present, so I, I'd like to ask the other three to stand, Sim, Sumner, and Stu. So Stephen Coles. Sumner Stone and Sim. The, the three in the middle there, Mark Dimination is the chief of rare books at the Library of Congress. Um, and Carl Hellman and Rick Richter are business people that I've worked with for 30 years. Um, Carl is, is a, a marketer and my mentor in marketing and, and consulting. And Rick um, started out working for me. Uh, and ended up as president of Simon & Schuster Children's Books, which is a $200 million business. Um, so I think about this more from a business point of view as, a, uh, as opposed to a nonprofit point of view. Um, and it, it's, it's been interesting because there is a very strong sort of body of conventional wisdom about how to run a nonprofit. Um, I frankly don't like most of that. Um, so I'm trying to do this in a very business-like way. Uh, here's a picture of the team. Uh, so the, the three in the middle, uh, Amelia's in white, Simran to, to the right of her, and Kate uh, are the three full-time people in addition to me. The other folks there are part-time or volunteers, and um, among the volunteers you'll see Jim Parkinson and son Helen uh, Isdal Cavanis. Uh, and by the way, that's our, our poster wall, uh, part of, you know, it's basically the part of the poster collection that's, um, that's exposed. Um, so here's a little bit about the collections. Um, the, the breadth of it is really the strength. Um, it's funny, when I was talking to institutions about donating it, often the first question is, who do you collect? Because they, they think of things, most collectors go into great depth on one or several things. And I've never been like that. I, my taste is very eclectic and I jump around a lot and it's all eras and all genres. Um, so I used to think of that as weakness until I started this project and then I realized that for this audience it's a strength because we can show sort of the breadth of the history of graphic design in a way that many institutions cannot. Um, all right, I'm going to run through these quickly because I'm running out of time, but these are just some examples from the collection. They're kind of random. They're sort of captures that we had. By the way, we put a lot of effort into photography using raking light and um, uh, an 80 megapixel phase one camera. So this is a wood type specimen by Stevenson Blake. Uh, this is the Gill Four Gospels. Uh, this is a writing book by Jan van de Velde, 1605, engraved. A piece of Russian constructivism, a uh, cover designed by Yuri Anenkov. Uh, this is by Piet Svard. On the left is the sketch, and on the right is the printed piece. Uh, the first specimen of um, Antique Olive. 
uh, one of the Bauhaus books. Um, Russian piece cover designed by Mayakovsky. Um, another Russian piece, anonymous designer. This is a, a periodical for women. It's called, sort of the ladies' home journal of Russia. Uh, the first issue of Merits, Kurt Schwitters. Um, this is uh, Paul Rand's presentation booklet for Steve Jobs for the design of the next logo. Um, this is, a, this is Eric Gill's proof copy of a little book called Three Book Types. Uh, the markup is his. And um, actually, this is on loan to the, to the Monotype Gill exhibit uh, next month. Uh, one example of Irma, Boom, Irma Boom's book design, cover on the left, the, the four edge. Actually, all of the edges are rough like this. Um, don't get me started about Irma Boom. Um, this is a mid-century modern piece. Um, even though it's for IBM, it's not Paul Rand. Um, the exhibit was designed by the Eames, and the brochure is designed by George Cherney. Uh, a psychedelic poster by Wes Wilson. Um, a brochure for, it's actually a printing company, although it was a show-off piece and had nothing to do with printing, uh, by Ladislav Sutnar. Um, a, a piece by Rudolf Koch, um, lithography on silk for the cover. Um, letterpress by um, H.N. Werkman. This is a, a, a wonderful book of playbills from the Haymarket Theater in the 1860s and 70s. A writing book by um, Cresci, uh, 1570 or so. Uh, these are um, calligraphy structure. Um, it's, a, it's a set of an alphabet uh, with overlays. It's by Anne Heckel, uh, who was one of my teachers. This is a book some of you may know. It's the History of Graphic Design. Um, as of yet, the collection isn't cataloged, but what we've started to do is tab reference books to indicate things that are in the archive. So the red dot means we have that piece. Um, in Megs, there are about 500 red dots. Um, this is a, a British manuscript from around 1860. I wish we had better resolution. I really do. Uh, this is by uh, uh, Francis Picabia, um, part of our collection of, of concrete poetry and shaped text and artist books. Um, a type specimen by um, Lucien Bernhard for Bauer. Um, this is by Maximilian Vox for de Berny and Pignon. Uh, Jan Chicold, a little, this is a wonderful little piece. It's, it's a combination of his early uh, new typography but it's actually a book of calligraphy instruction for typesetters. OK. So the last big addition to the collection is the Tolinar collection, which um, we acquired this year. It was delivered a couple of months ago. We had to rent another unit to house it because it basically doubled the size of our collection. We went from 15,000 pieces to 30,000. These two books are all taken from the collection, but they just show a small part of it. This is Jan Tolinar and a summary of what was in the collection. It's unpacked now, but it'll be a while before we get it organized. Um, OK. The, these are some of our guiding principles in contrast with the usual rare book library. Um, I think it's kind of a self-explanatory table, but um, I think um, the, the main thing I'd like to point out, the, the, the sentence at the end, the thing that is most likely to inspire you is not the one you asked for. And I think that's the biggest problem with most collections of this kind from the point of view of a designer. 
you have to know exactly what to ask for if you go to a rare book group. And how do you know, I mean, how are you going to find something that's new and fresh and inspiring if you already know it? Like, it's, there's a disconnect there. Um, by the way, I do not mean this as a knock on rare book libraries. Our, our peers like the LeBallon Center and the Cary Library and, and St. Bride's and so on, they do wonderful work. Those are subject focused. The more general ones um, also do wonderful work and I've been a part of that world for a long time and, and um, benefit, benefited from it greatly. Uh, I also want to say that even though it may sound like we're opposed to scholarship or research, we're not. We welcome scholars and researchers. Uh, the collection is for everyone. But our primary focus is inspiring designers. Um, this is a little bit about how we think about running it as a business. Um, the four things on the left are the traditional nonprofit fundraising techniques. Um, the things on the right are, in a sense, business units. So I'm back in the publishing business. I'm back in the book selling business. I'm back in the hospitality business. <laughs> I'm basically using everything I've ever done in my life. Uh, and then the, the um, it's, actually it's funny because a, a lot of people ask me, well, why are you bothering with it? Like, this is such a big thing. Um, and I have to tell them, I'm having a blast doing this. Like, I can't imagine not doing it. Um, so it's really no hardship. On the other hand, it won't be sustainable without you. So basically, I've seed funded this. I wanted to create something that was real and working and equipped and out in the world so that you all could see it and use it and get to know it. Um, I didn't ask for money at the very beginning because I didn't happen to need to but also because I wanted to make it real. Now that it's real, I'm not going to live forever. And the goal is for Letterform Archive to live forever. So I need your help to sustain this. Um, this is the uh, partnership with Typet Cooper. Um, I think we're, we're handing out or have handed out uh, some flyers about this. Here are a few of the titles that are coming um, in our publishing program. Uh, book selling begins here. The exhibit is all for sale. But I have to tell you, this, so this is, if anybody hasn't seen it, this is our exhibit of type ephemera, which is in the, the museum building on the second floor with the other exhibits. Everything in it is for sale and is labeled. I have to point out that the dollar sign, which I now understand also means reals, in this case means US dollars. Um, <laughs> and, and I also have to tell you that about a third of it is already sold. Uh, but we have about another 100 pieces or so in the sale section today, and the, there's a room over to the side. Um, this is an example of an event at the archive. This was a dinner for 20, 20 type designers uh, a couple of weeks ago. So one of the things that we do is dinners and receptions and brunches and things. Um, here are some things you can do to, to uh, be involved and take advantage of the resource and also to help sustain us. Um, we are planning a charter membership drive for next year and um, uh, we would love to have all your contact info, of course. Um, but you know, it's interesting because some people have been confused about whether this is a business or a nonprofit. Let me be very clear. It's a nonprofit. The things that we're doing that are sort of business like are to raise money for the nonprofit, but they're also all aligned with our mission and for the same audience, and we think of them as a service to the community. So, book publishing, events, education um, yes, they're revenue sources, but they're also services to the community. 